Conference. My name is Dr. Tracy Pickett, and I'm the uh, medical director at the BC Women's Sexual Assault Service. I'm an emergency room physician at uh, VGH, and I work at the Vancouver City Jail, and uh, I'm the past president of the Medical Legal Society of British Columbia. I'm also a clinical professor at uh, UBC in the Department of Emergency Medicine. So thank you all for coming. I, uh, I know that this can be an anxiety-producing topic for a lot of people. I just want to say that I don't think I have any real disclaimers um, or anything to disclose. I uh, do obviously work with the, uh, in the criminal justice system in the Vancouver City Jail. I'm also uh, on the uh, roster of experts at the International Criminal Court in The Hague for crimes against humanity and rape used as an instrument of war. Haven't had any cases there yet that I've had to deal with, but I thought I should probably put that out there. Um, I don't have any affiliation with industry, and if I did, I'd probably own an island in the South Pacific somewhere, and I wouldn't be here. And I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take any of your legal advice from me. I just want to kind of give you my perspective, having been on both sides of the fence, and uh, don't necessarily represent the views of Women's Hospital, St. Paul's Hospital, or any other uh, CMPA or any other organization. So I hope to have lots of time for questions at the end because I think that that's a really important part of this talk. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, at the end when we get there. So the, sort of the objectives of this, I, I, this is actually a talk I wanted to give last year, but I ran out of time for because I suddenly realized that this is a really big topic. Um, you know, this, the, the idea that there's a subpoena in the waiting room, I think terrifies, just the word subpoena terrifies a lot of people. So I wanted to kind of put it out there about, you know, how often am I likely to be involved in legal action? What do I do if I am involved in legal action? And what can I expect? Because it's a, it can be a bit of a bumpy road. And I don't know about any of you, but, uh, and maybe just answer these questions within yourself. You don't necessarily have to stick up your hand, but I myself never got any teaching on legal aspects of medicine when I was in medical school. All I got was, don't get sued. And that was about the extent of it. And I don't know how many of you had sort of similar teachings from your uh, mentors in school. But, you know, just think to yourself, how many times have I had to testify in court? Uh, if I've had to testify in court, have I been a fact witness? Have I been an expert witness? I don't know what kind of witness I was. I didn't know what I was doing there. I'm not even sure what the case was about. Um, there's probably, most people in this room can probably say they're a little bit terrified that they're going to get some sort of uh, proposal to go to court. And, uh, and it's really just not something that we're taught about in medical school that I think is a really important aspect of what we do. So, hopefully we'll get some Okay, should I just pause it? Okay, so what I'm going to show is just a couple of little short video clips, and I'll have a couple throughout this uh, presentation. Um, the first one is obviously Dr. McCoy, and the reason I have this in is because I think in emergency medicine, or in medicine in general, that we're very good at being a doctor, but it also means wearing lots of different hats. And we do many, many different things, and we don't necessarily recognize um, the expertise we have in other areas of our daily job. And, uh, and that's the beauty of being in emergency medicine. You get to see lots of different things, and you get to be lots of different people to different, different organizations. And uh, sometimes it's very unclear what your role actually is or how that's going to unfold. So. Everybody's familiar with Star Trek, right? I'm not showing my age, am I? <laughs> Maybe I am. But. My name is McCoy. I'm a doctor. What am I, a doctor or a moon shuttle conductor? I jumped every time a light came on around here. I'd end up talking to myself. I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. You're a healer. There's a patient. That's an order. I'm a surgeon, not a psychiatrist. Look. I'm a doctor, not an escalator. Spock, give me a hand. I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. No, you're an engineer. I'm a doctor, not a coal miner. You keep saying that. Are you a doctor, aren't you? I don't know. So, um, outline the medical uh, for this little talk here. The first one is just going to be sort of an outline of the Canadian uh, legal framework, uh, just in one slide, only because it's complicated and a lot of people don't know about how complicated it is. Why should you care as a physician or a nurse who is uh, in uh, medicine? 
What do I do if I get notified of legal action? And how do I sort of proceed through that, so hopefully as seamlessly as possible? How does a trial unfold, and how is my role different in different circumstances? Because there's lots of different ways you're about to find out how you can be involved in legal, um, in legal sort of services. And introduction to a legal technique called boxing using an actual ER case. Uh, I'm hoping, I think that's probably going to be, may, maybe you guys can disagree with me, but might be the most interesting part for this, this group. And so I'll try and focus most of my attention on that actual aspect. Okay, the Canadian legal system. I had no idea that this is how complicated the legal system was in Canada. We have all these different sort of courts. Now, most people are probably fairly familiar with the provincial level courts and, and the Supreme Court of British Columbia, you know, sort of feeding on up to the um, provincial court of appeal and then to the Supreme Court of Canada. But there's also these other sort of side courts. There's the um, military tribunal courts. Uh, there's the tax court of British Columbia, or pardon me, the tax court of Canada. I was actually really interested to know that the tax court of Canada is nothing about justice. It's just about whether or not the law is being followed. Um, so there's no fairness in the, in the federal court of uh, taxes. So uh, I just found that sort of an interesting thing. But it, as I say, it is quite a complicated system, and most people would never necessarily be aware of that. Most of the time, we're just focusing, you know, in our general practice on the provincial courts and also um, at the basic level in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. So the Canadian legal system can roughly sort of be broken down into two sort of sides. I'm going to sort of focus initially on the sort of the criminal side uh, because that's the one that most people are most familiar with. And when I do my sexual assault work, that's usually the camp that I'm, I'm involved in it. So, you know, offenses are made under the criminal code, which are laws made by the federal government in, in parliament. Um, they're not provincial laws. And the crown, who is the representative of the state or the people, has to has an onus to sort of prove that there was some sort of criminal conduct, something bad happened, but not only that, there, there was some sort of motivation to have that happen. And a lot of people don't understand that both of those, those factors need to be proven in court for there to be a conviction. Now, the other thing in the criminal court is that the burden of proof, you have to, you know, is, is different than it is in a civil case. So it means that you have to essentially be, you know, 99% certain that, you know, person A murdered person B. It's not just a more likely than not sort of um, happenstance. So the, the burden of proof is what we call beyond reasonable doubt. If you contrast that with the sort of the common or civil law system, the matters are, are sort of private law. They're, they're made up of rules that are made up by the province. Um, and each province would be slightly different. So if you think about, for example, the Mental Health Act um, and apprehending somebody as a, in BC of a Form 4, it's, it's the, the jurisdiction is, very, is slightly different in BC than it is in Alberta or Ontario or anywhere else. So the, it, each province makes up those rules. Usually common law applies to things like what we call property or torts or, you know, um, other sort of forms of sort of actions between people. Um, now, interestingly, in the civil law side of things is the burden of proof is only sort of just the balance of probability. So you just have to kind of be 51% certain that it's, this happened, you know, as opposed to actually beyond reasonable doubt. And again, that wasn't a distinction I really understood until I had had um, experience on sort of both sides of these. Now, you can get things like a sexual assault, I, and that's, I kind of keep kind of going back to sexual assault cases because those are the ones I'm most familiar with, is that they can also go through a civil action. And um, often at the end of a civil action, it's not a criminal charge that this person is faced with, but you know, if, if an accused is, is charged under a civil sort of thing, there can be a, a payment for, for basically being wronged. And so there's sometimes a monetary settlement. It's not common for sexual assault cases to go that way, but that's one example of how a case could go either way. Okay. Why should you care? I'm an eMERGE doc. I'm a good eMERGE doc. I'm not going to get sued. Well, actually, the balance of probabilities will be that you will get sued. So, um, you know, and there's different ways that you can be involved in, this, in the legal system. And that's sort of a little bit of what I want to explore here. You know, so there may be the chance that you get sued, or you may be asked to be an expert witness. 
And sometimes you'll be asked to be an expert witness on a case, perhaps for a colleague who's being sued. So these are all sort of ways that this is all sort of interacting, and often people don't understand the difference. So, you know, I've kind of tried to break this up into different ways that, you know, physicians can be involved. And I, I, this is largely geared towards physicians, but it also can be related to nurses and things as well who are in the medical field. So if you stick on sort of what I would, I've arbitrarily decided this is called the sort of the complaint side of things. You know, it may be having a hospital complaint initiated against you. It may be a college complaint from a patient or a, or a colleague. Uh, you may actually be sued or you may have a patient who threatens a legal action against you. Um, some sort of billing audit that comes from MSP or through somebody else. Uh, you know, some sort of criminal proceeding, whether or not it's related to medicine. Uh, it's, for example, drinking and driving or you're selling your narcotics out your back door. Um, privacy legislation breaches or any sort of human rights complaints. So there's lots of different ways that you can be involved. I think I missed in there um, any inquests or coroner sort of, uh, you know, proceedings. So those are all sort of somehow I would put into the kind of the complaints sort of side of things. The other side is this, what I call this expertise side. And um, that's not something necessarily that people sort of think about. When they think about legal action, they think, oh, I'm going to get sued, or I am getting sued. And they don't actually think about other roles that they can play in the justice system, uh, providing expertise to the, to the justice. OK. If you go back to the complaint side of things, usually what will happen is you'll get some sort of subpoena or summons or something telling you that something has been initiated. Uh, you know, basically a summons or a subpoena is basically a command for you to appear or to produce some sort of evidence um, so that on a certain date, and to defy that is a contempt. So you, you actually have to do it. You have to do what this piece of paper says. And the subpoena can arrive in any sort of number of ways, shapes, and forms. It can happen when you're working. Often that's, uh, that's often what happens. They know when you're going to work. Uh, so they turn up at work and they hand you a subpoena. It's not very dramatic, generally. It's sort of like, hey, are you Dr. Pickett? Yes, I'm Dr. Pickett. I have this piece of paper for you. Oh, dear. And then you sign a little piece of paper to say that you received it, and you open it up, and that's what it is, OK? Um, the last one that I got, I was actually at the playground with my kid, <laughs> and they arrived. Or, you know, they can arrive on your front door and knock on your door. You know, when they arrived at the play, it wasn't that they were stalking me. I did say, I'm going to be at the playground at 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. That's where I'll be. Come and find me. Um, when you get this piece of paper, what I would suggest you do is contact the CMPA because they're going to be your helper in this. Um, you end up meeting with a lawyer, you have some preparation, you have discovery to find out what the case is about, there is some sort of settlement made or there's a trial and then there's a decision and that's kind of the end of the process. I made that all sound very flowery and very nice. It's not necessarily flowery or nice, but that's kind of the, how the process unfolds. The second part is with this gr group two, what I call this expertise side of things. So somebody phones you up, a lawyer phones you up usually and says, you know, I've got a case that might, you know, I, I would like your help with. They often give you a brief summary of it. You get forwarded specific questions about what you need to answer. You review the documents that you were given or that you request and um, write a report. And then this either gets settled or it goes to trial or some sort of tribunal or whatever. And there's a decision. And at the end of it, you get paid. So that's a nice little bonus. Um, so for example, with a sexual assault case, one of the things I might be asked um, or a strangulation case, um, you know, were these injuries life-threatening? Or, you know, were these injuries the result of the motor vehicle accident? Or, you know, those kind of, the, you get asked specific questions that you answer in your report. As for, as res with respect to getting paid, it's generally not a lot. You get paid about the same as what you would get paid to work. So, you get any one of those complaints type sort of, you know, letters or initiation of something or some sort of notification that something's happening, 
I, I'm not a spokesperson for the CMPA, but I would suggest you call the CMPA, okay? That's why you pay your $800 a month to be a member of the CMPA. I've actually personally renamed my first child CMPA. Um, they're very helpful, generally, um, and it's a, it's a good, useful resource that you should use because this is what you pay for, okay? Most of the cases that physicians sort of fear the most are these sort of negligence cases. Okay, and people sort of like, well, what is negligence? It's a form of tort law. And what it means is that there was some sort of failure to take reasonable care to avoid causing injury or loss to another person. And so there is a duty to take care for a person. Um, I'll give you a scenario. Somebody arrives in your emergency department uh, as a pedestrian struck. You know, your job is to look after that patient, okay? You have to prove that there is some sort of breach of duty, i.e. that the circumstances didn't meet the standard of care. So uh, maybe if your pedestrian was struck, you were out having a smoke or you had gone to the bathroom and had been there for 25 minutes. So you weren't able to actually see the patient. You know, there was something, something didn't go maybe necessarily to plan. There is some sort of injury or loss. Okay, buddy died because they bled out while they were waiting in your waiting room. Okay, there's a loss there. Um, and the damage was caused by the breach of duty. Well, that's because you were on your coffee break. You know, that's a very sort of glib sort of example. But, and there's always, you know, pros and cons to every side of everything. Um, so, you know, it's not wrong to make a mistake, right? If you have somebody who's been kicked in the face by a horse and their airway is hamburger and you do your best to put the tube down and you kind of get it in the esophagus but you recognize that it's there and you know it's you know and you pull it out and you put it you know there's a delay in intubation whatever that's a bad situation but there's not a mistake okay it's a little bit different than you know putting a tube down somebody not having co2 monitor hooked up having them hooked up to suction instead of oxygen you know those kind of things those are a lot you know more difficult to justify so um, any sort of i would suggest any sort of suggestion that you've done anything wrong then you know again contact cmpa they will walk you through this whole process okay but as i say it's okay to make a mistake but you do have to um, you know, be able to walk through everything. The other thing that actually people don't understand, especially as emergency room doctors, is that all of the rest of the stuff that's going on in the background and in your emergency department, you know, the 25 people sitting in the waiting room and the three level ones that you just got at the same time and all the other people from the pedestrian struck, um, doesn't play a bearing on that individual case because, you know, so that's not something that you can transmit if you end up going to court about what else was going on because that's not part of their picture. They have a very um, centered view on what, what they're, they're looking at. I'm going to leave that because every case is, of course, individual and, and things, but, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about the expertise side of things because this is something that people are maybe not familiar with. I don't know if you can actually read this cartoon, but it says, expert for hire, have opinions, will travel, and then the other side says, wanted for lack of objectivity and breach of duties. And so that's sort of the conundrum of, of being an expert in any of these sort of cases. Uh, so what is an expert? That's a challenge, okay? And that's something that has to be defined each time in court uh, in front of the judge. So most of the time, we talk about something called a fact witness. A fact witness is somebody who saw or observed what happened. And in the very sort of rudimentary sense, you know, did you treat patient Joanne Smith on this date? And that's sort of the basics of being a fact witness. Now, an expert witness is somebody that the judge has deemed has special education or knowledge or training, um, whose role is to aid the trier of fact, who's the judge or the jury in some cases, in making their decision. So they're not there as an advocate for the patient. They're there to be objective and impartial and independent and inform the judge so that the judge can make their, their decision. And sort of the typical, you know, from my perspective, when I go to court, it's usually on sexual assault cases. Most judges don't know anything about sexual assault um, and don't know anything about medicine, so I'm talking about injuries and I'm trying to inform them about, you know, the likelihood of finding injuries in certain circumstances, those kind of things. 
and that helps the judge make their decision about sexual assault. I can't go in there and say, you know, this woman was sexually assaulted or this man was sexually assaulted. That's for them to decide, but I can give them the information for them to make that decision. Now, the beauty of being an expert witness is you're allowed to give an opinion, and often you'll be asked hypotheticals. You know, in this situation, you know, do, what would be the chance of, you know, or what is your opinion about such and such? And you're not, as a fact witness, you're not allowed to give opinion evidence. So, so it is a very, very powerful position to be in. Um, now, I'm hoping that my video is going to work here. In this video, we will discuss... Can we turn it up a wee bit? Witnesses. Two yeah, major too. types of court witnesses are so-called fact witnesses and expert witnesses. You might sometimes hear fact witnesses referred to as eyewitnesses or percipient witnesses. Fact witnesses will usually testify about things they experienced, things they saw, things they heard. But a fact witness can usually not give an opinion about a topic that requires special knowledge or special education. However, an expert witness may testify as to her opinion. A witness can be an expert based on her knowledge, skill, training, education, and experience. An expert's opinion must be based upon sufficient facts or data and reliable principles or methods. Let's say there is a shooting. This is so American. <laughs> People who saw or heard the shooting might have relevant information. For example, a witness could testify as to what the victim was doing before the shooting. A witness could probably testify as to how many shots he heard. But let's say our fact witness is asked to testify as to the muzzle velocity of a pistol. Or if the witness is asked about the path of a bullet. This witness probably can't answer the question because he's not an expert. Answering these questions requires special knowledge, education, or training. Only an expert in forensic science or ballistics would be allowed to answer a question about the path of a bullet. So as a first step, the witness must demonstrate that she has the necessary qualifications as an expert. If she has the qualifications of an expert, she may be allowed to give her opinion. Provided the opinion is based on sufficient facts or data and sound principles or methods. To discuss further, please visit the Sorry, that was a little disclaimer for who um, produced that. I'm happy to, to uh, produce all my references at the end. So how, how does an expert get defined? You know, you can't just walk into court and say, oh, I'm going to tell you all about X, Y, Z. Um, and what it is is it's a little bit like a Shakespeare play. There's sort of a trial within a trial in front of the judge, not in front of the jury, to disclose what you know and what your training is. Um, the jury is asked to leave at... at do, when, when they have this voir dire. So, hopefully, can we just pause this for a half a sec? No? I've got a little video here of a, a movie scene from, anybody recognize this movie? My cousin Vinny, great, great movie. Anyways, about a, a court case. She gets on the stand, she's the, the um, girlfriend of uh, Joe Pesci, and she says, I, what he, the first thing they say is, what's your profession? She says, I'm an out-of-work hairdresser. And she's being qualified as an expert in um, auto mechanics. Okay, can I just go ahead with that? Hopefully the volume will be loud enough. Engine rebuilds, we built some trannies, rear ends. Okay, okay. But does being an ex-mechanic necessarily qualify you as being an expert on tire marks? No. Thank you. Goodbye. Sit down and stay there until you're told to leave. Oh, there's a f bomb coming. Dis disclosure. Your Honor, Ms. Vito's expertise is in general automotive knowledge. It is in this area that her testimony will be applicable. Now, if Mr. Trotter wishes to voir dire a witness as to the extent of her expertise in this area, I'm sure he's going to be more than satisfied. Okay. 
All right. All right. Now, uh, Ms. Vito, being an expert on general automotive knowledge, can you tell me what would the correct ignition timing be on a 1955 Bel Air Chevrolet with a 327 cubic inch engine and a full barrel carburetor? It's a bullshit question. Does Don't that mean bullshit that you can't please? answer it? It's a bullshit question. It's impossible to answer. Impossible because you don't know the answer. Nobody could answer that question. Your Honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Vito as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No, it is a trick question. Why is it a trick question? Watch this. Because Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 didn't come out till 62. And it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four barrel carb till 64. However, in 1964, the correct ignition timing would be four degrees before top dead center. Well, oh. Uh, she's acceptable, Your Honor. So thank goodness it's never actually like that. But I just think that that's such a great clip. And they do actually use that in the law school to kind of introduce and teach people the whole idea of how to, how to do a voir dire. So, um, you know, it occurs, it occurs before you give your testimony. Usually you'll be led through your CV. You're always asked to disclose your CV before you get there. The, you know, the defense also has to have a copy of your CV at least a month before you're actually there in trial. Um, they specifically kind of go through for physicians, your education, your training, any subspecialty training that you've done, um, current and remote employment as related to uh, your area of expertise that you're being qualified in, uh, any distinguishing qualifications that you have, if you have some sort of, you know, being to conference conferences or you've, um, you've done some sort of teaching or made videos or have any publications. And then if you've done this a few times, they usually want a list of any cases where you've been an expert and what you've been an expert in. Okay. What is the actual court process from the witness's point of view? You know, and this is, I've, I've really sort of butchered this down to just, you, you know, you, hopefully not you, but you, if you end up going, what you're going to need to do. Basically, you get called to the stand, you get sworn in, there's a voir dire to disclose whatever your area of expertise is going to be, and sometimes, you know what, you're not always actually granted the expertise that you think you're going to be given. And in fact, that I had a case almost uh, along those lines, and that's what actually sort of fostered me going into this whole line of medicine, and I can tell you about that afterwards. Um, after they've sort of figured out what you're allowed to give opinion evidence on and what your expertise is, you get what they call direct examination. It's when you get asked questions by the side that called you. And then you actually have cross-examination from the side who didn't call you. Usually, in my case, it's usually defense is then doing cross-examination. And then there's the opportunity, if necessary, for um, redirect. So meaning the first person who uh, was asking you questions gets to ask and just clarify anything else that was brought up in cross-examination. And then basically, you get excused. And once you get excused, if you're keen, you can hang around and hear the rest of the court case. Often goes on for several days. Um, they call the next witness. Uh, at the end of all the witnesses being called, what happens is they have closing arguments, and then um, there's, you know, some sort of deliberation either with the jury or with the judge, and and that's sort of the end of the case per se. Often you don't find out the judgment until weeks or months. In some cases, many months later. So. Now, um, because I recognize that this is a really kind of a, a, a frightening aspect for a lot of people, uh, Michael Thomas, who's a lawyer at uh, Harper Gray, and I have put together a series of little videos, and they're cringeworthy, and that's why I'm not going to show them to you here. But we're going to try and put them together and possibly have them, uh, I don't know, with the CMPA, I've put it out to them. Uh, because we're using them as a teaching tool. To, Michael uses this all the time at Harper Gray in Vancouver to show physicians and also law students how to cross-examine uh, a physician, or basically any witness. Now, Michael's a fantastic guy. He also did an interrogation course with the FBI, and he's absolutely brutal. Um, and, uh, but I work with him on the Medical Legal Society, and we thought that this was a really important uh, topic to talk about. So we're trying to put this together into an actual little CME. If any of you are involved with Harper Gray, you might be asked to watch some of these videos. It, it, all together, it takes about four hours to kind of go through the whole program. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through this little CME that we're in the process of putting together and give you an idea 
idea of, of what it is that, you know, how you get cornered and when, when you're up on the stand. And, and it's pretty difficult to get out of those situations. But now I'm running a little short on time. So what the next video, if I've got it here, is uh, we're going to skip. Okay, it's just the factuals in the case. So I'll give you the factuals in the case. It was um, a fictitious case. It's a young woman who's involved in an MVA, uh, has some uh, seen in the emergency department by myself, who has some minor sort of. I, I diagnosed her with a concussion and some minor whiplash sort of neck pain. Uh, sent her home with some ibuprofen. I do actually do a fairly complete neurological exam on her. Um, as you'll find out, it wasn't complete enough. And then what happens is she goes home, and that night she um, plays hockey. She gets a header into the boards. And then she's now trying to prove that her injuries were the result of the motor vehicle accident and not because of getting a header into the boards. So that's kind of the, the case that we made up. Um, so what Michael does, this lawyer that I'm working with, he takes the ED record. He takes the MSP payment information uh, printout to show that I got paid for seeing this patient. He uh, takes the definitions uh, needed for charting that are in the uh, BCMA fee guide. Um, he takes a journal on cognitive impairment, a uh, journal article, just a case report. Uh, he takes a copy of the ER nursing notes and the CTAS guidelines and a chapter from Tintinelli and basically Spoiler alert, fries me. So um, what happens in direct examination, I just go through my chart and, you know, I did this and I did that. And when I say I did a reasonably thorough neurological exam, I actually did counting backwards by threes and I got her up and walked and, you know, finger nose. I tested, you know, seven of the 12 cranial nerves, that kind of stuff. I would have said it was a reasonable exam. Um, and then Michael does cross-examination. The first thing he does is... Uh, he goes through the MSP payment guide and says, what do you need to satisfy in order to be paid for this encounter? And I had met that. I saw the patient and I documented, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, and I got paid. He showed that I got paid for seeing that patient. So check. He um, then goes through the MSP guide to look at what needs to be recorded on a chart. Um, he then asked me questions about whether or not I met the CTAS guidelines, and it's all on the nursing notes about when I saw the patient and when the patient got triaged. And then he uses the medical literature to establish the, the, the standard of care. And then he asked me questions regarding the extent of my memory regarding the patient, and then um, questions any of the tests that I did. So yeah, I got paid by the, for the patient, he points out that I didn't do um, all aspects required on a chart. And I don't know how many of you are actually aware that on the BCMA fee guide for charting, you actually have to document allergies, chief complaint that they come in, and also things like social history. How many of you ever write down social history on your ER charts, right? And that's actually a requirement for satisfactory charting. Okay, and I'm just saying that a lot of these are unobtainable goals. So, so this is what they, they sort of push at. Um, shows I didn't meet the CTAS guidelines for my level three or four patient who got triaged to treatment. Um, and how many of your patients sitting in treatment actually meet their CTAS guidelines? Like, you know, I don't know about you guys, but we have a four to six hour wait at VGH for treatment. Nobody's meeting their CTAS guidelines. Um, he makes me go through Tintinelli, the chapter in Tintinelli on the neurological exam, which is only sort of four pages or whatever, has me sort of say, oh yes, you know, we use Tintinelli to train our residents, it's an authoritative source. And then what he does is he goes through the seven steps in Tintinelli for a complete neurological exam, and because I saw the patient walking to the bed, but I didn't observe her turn, and I didn't observe her do a tandem gait, and I didn't do heel shin testing, that I didn't actually do a complete neurological exam. Um, he then showed me a copy of the Indian Journal of Neurosurgical Trauma or some completely irrelevant resource and conceded, and I conceded to as well, I would never know this journal, I would never look at this journal, but it's a case report that is almost exactly the same. I don't think the woman was playing hockey afterwards, but anyways, the same sort of story. And she ended up having a cerebellar hematoma. And, um, 
there we go. Because I didn't actually chart all my pertinent negatives, and I had to say, oh, this case was four years ago, I didn't have any independent recall, and what I didn't write down, as far as the legal side is concerned, I didn't perform. So there I was, you know, splattered like Bambi meets Godzilla. And, and, but that's the reality of kind of what happens, and that's how the, this technique is called boxing, where they box you into a corner and basically impeach you. So I'm going to skip these next two little videos there. As I say, if, if and when we get the CME up and running, you'll be able to see that if you want. Um, I'm just going to sort of take a little bit of a segue, and I'm just going to divert into mental health. Um, look after your own mental health, uh, especially if you're the subject of any sort of legal action. Sometimes these cases take years. I'm not talking like one year or two years. We're talking five or six years. It's okay to talk about your, your, how the case makes you feel with a loved one or your family doctor or somebody uh, that you trust. You can't talk about the details of the case. Um, it can be gut-wrenching. It can be very, very difficult. Um, the, the time off work, if you end up taking time off work, is not financially compensated unless you claim disability. Uh, there may be reasons why you don't necessarily want to claim disability because you might be told that you're not able to work. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some resources out there, a the few on the CMPA website, uh, uh, for resources if you are struggling uh, emotionally with having to go through this, especially if you are the subject of something. Takeaway message, by choice or by circumstances, you're, you're likely to be involved somehow in this, whether or not you want to or choose to. Um, get informed. Be your own best advocate. What I would suggest if you do get called for something like this, especially if you're getting sued or named in some sort of action, is spend a day in court. The legal system in, in Canada is open to the public, and it's a tremendous opportunity just to go and see how it all plays out. Um, what do judges get called, how you sit, how you address people, where the important players are. That learning is invaluable. Um, you would never go and, you know, you know, take out somebody's appendix without having at least seen one and gone to the operating room. And so I would suggest the same thing if you have to go to court. And look after yourself because it can be a pretty hard and tough road. Um, and uh, confide in your colleagues. Uh, you'll find if it's, it's a little bit of a dirty secret, once you talk to people, uh, most of your colleagues have probably been sued and it's not something that anybody ever wants to talk about. Anyways, on that note, I have got 11 seconds to go. Whew. Um, I think 